evening and praise the Lord, everyone. Uh, good evening. Certainly, we thank the Lord uh, for being here on tonight. We are in our spring revival. Spring revival has now, uh, if you will, officially uh, commenced. Uh, and we are opening on tonight uh, with our lecture. Uh, our lecture uh, for tonight is entitled Waging War. Uh, but not alone, a waging war, but not alone. Uh, and so certainly we thank the Lord. And if you would uh, follow along with us, two pieces of scripture that will be uh, yielded uh, on tonight's lecture will be uh, that of Acts, the first chapter. Uh, and uh, oh, well, that's a little different on the program, but it's going to be Acts. Uh, the first chapter and the ninth through the eleventh uh, verses, not nine through one. Amen. Uh, do me a favor. If y'all got a program, uh, stop passing them programs out. Yeah, don't pass those programs out. I, I don't want nobody to think I'm I'm that slow. Uh, I, I wanted to say Acts nine through eleven, not Acts nine through one. Uh, so we'll just we'll just do a. We'll do a quick reprint when I finish this lecture. Amen. So if you follow along with us, uh, chapter uh, Acts chapter one, uh, verses nine through 11, and then uh, we will look to uh, second Corinthians, not two Corinthians, but second Corinthians. Uh, you'll get that on the way home. Second Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, verses 1 uh, through uh, 11. Uh, and so uh, starting off, uh, read the scriptures and then I'll move into pivot into the lecture. Uh, Acts chapter 1, uh, the 9th through the 11th verses here, we find these words. And when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. Amen. So it is, and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Two men stood by them in white apparel. And then uh, the 11th verse, which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Uh, that's Acts, uh, the first chapter, uh, the ninth through uh, the eleventh uh, verses. And then, if you would also place your thumb uh, in a longer piece of text that we will uh, matriculate through. Uh, on tonight being uh, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, uh, and the first uh, through the 11 verses. Now, I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence I am base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence, wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience. And moving on, when your obedience is fulfilled, do ye look on things after the outward appearance? 
If any man trust to himself that he is Christ, let him of himself think this again, that as he is, is Christ, even so are we Christ. For though I should boast somewhat, more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us for edification and not for your destruction. I should not be ashamed that I may not seem as if I would terrify you by letters. For his letters say they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Let such and one think this, that such as we are in word by letters, when we are absent, such will we be also indeed when we are present. Pray with me a moment. Uh, merciful master, and most righteous redeemer, gracious God. We thank you for the spring revival. Thank you uh, for these moments of lecture. Lord, thank you for the food that has been received even as we uh, embark upon the spring revival and into this lecture. Have your way even now, dear master, that we would hear from you and be edified even the more by that of the word that will come forth during this period. Amen. Waging war, but not alone. Many moons ago, I had the opportunity to connect with the United Methodist Church by way of uh, the state of Pennsylvania, where they engaged a number of preachers to come together to preach a sermon series entitled simply Waging War. This was more than a decade ago at this point, uh, and it is still even in the year 2024 that we are in war. We are at War. War is upon us. And I'm not talking about that of what may be transpiring in Ukraine, that of what may be transpiring in the Middle East at this time. I'm not talking about what may be happening in the low economical uh, jurisdictions of our country or in the impoverished places that we uh, dare not venture to as we uh, journey through this land. But I'm more so talking about uh, the spiritual war that we are entrenched in, whether we like it or not. Oftentimes when we hear the term war, we get terrified. We get frightened. We get a bit perplexed. We, we, we even at times can become somewhat enraged because in war, there has to be sides. Oftentimes we don't like to pick sides. Sometimes we think that we can be on everybody's side. They have a good point. They have a good point. But in war, you have to be on one side or the other. Or if you're found caught in the middle by either side, oftentimes if you have no value to you, you are destroyed. The only individuals that are held captive in the midst of war are those that actually have some manner of valuation to them. We know this as we look around and we have persons that are of American descent in foreign countries and they are what? Holding them hostage because they feel that they have some kind of value and some kind of leverage to them that if they are held that the country that we are, uh, they are from will provide something to save their lives. But if they already know that the country who they want something from, that the person hails from, has no value in them, they will go ahead and dispense of them as if they are nothing. Oftentimes when we come to the places of spiritual warfare, we believe that the devil finds value in us. Can I encourage all of us today to understand that the enemy has no valuation in you. You 
have no valuation to the enemy. The enemy already knows what his end is going to be. You have more valuation to the creator. You know why? Because the creator is seeking to have you come back to him. See, here it is. When we look at this situation, we come to the point and place of warfare where we believe that we are equipped to argue, fight and exchange a dastardly blows with the enemy. But we are not. You and I are not equipped. You and I do not have the wherewithal. You and I do not have that of what it takes to bring destruction to the enemy. That does not mean that you are insignificant, that you are unimportant, that you are weak, that you are feeble. That just means that that is not your fight. How do I know? Because the Lord has already stated in the scriptures what he's going to do to the enemy when it comes to the end of time. See, if it was so that any of us had the ability to destroy the enemy, then it would have been done already. But it has not because it is not for us to do. See, here's the thing. When it comes to waging war, when it comes to being in war, the most important process of war for each individual is to carry out what their duty is. See, when you have individuals and for anyone, I've never been in war from a military standpoint, but if you have been in the service, if you have gone and fought in any manner of war, you understand that in each uh, regimen, there are persons that have specific duties and everybody goes out functioning as if each person is going to do their duty and no person's duty is insignificant or unimportant. Whether you are the mechanic, whether you are the cook, whether you are in the weaponry field, whether you are the commander, everybody has their a specific job to do. And when persons don't do their duty, then things become out of whack. Things begin to unravel. Things begin to to unfold in ways that provide the instance for the war to be lost on your behalf if persons don't carry out their duty. If the cook does not carry out their duty, then the soldiers are not able to eat and gain their sustenance and gain their strength. If the auto mechanics don't do their duty, then the, then the motorcycles, then the RVs, then the tanks, they won't work. They won't function. They won't operate. If, if they don't align with the weaponry personnel, then the tanks won't have the proper bullets, ammunition, and firepower that they need if they don't do all of these different things to coincide and connect and things begin to break down. That means that somebody is not carrying out their duty. See, when it comes to war, when it comes to waging war, you don't just go waging war and you don't have everything that you need in order to wage war. So what are you saying, preacher? What I'm saying is, is that one, understand that when you go to war, you don't go to war alone. And the Lord is not asking us to go to war alone. But there is my Christian friend, my brother, my sister, my believer uh, in the word of God. We have to understand that there is, yes, a time and it is a current time that we are to be in the midst of waging war. Somebody said, well, what do you mean? Are you telling me that I'm supposed to go out and take up arms and just go and start firing? No, that's not what I'm saying. But I am saying that it's time to stop sitting on the sidelines. It is time to stop a daydreaming and stargazing. It is time to stop sitting back and talking about everything that is going wrong. And it is time to start being a part of the solution to aid in the a securing of souls for the Savior. 
Here's the thing, my friends, it's time for us to get aggressive. As we look at 2 Corinthians, Paul begins to open up here and he says, by uh, the humility and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you. I, Paul, who am timid when face to face with you, but bold toward you went away. Paul says, I may be timid when I'm face to face with you, but understand I am appealing to you, not as myself, but I'm appealing to you based upon the Savior and the Redeemer, Christ Jesus. This is so amazing and interesting because Paul has described himself, what, as a chiefest of sinners. This is amazing because Paul was a warrior. Paul was one who, what, killed and persecuted Christians. Paul is no, if I use a different manner of vernacular, he is no sucker. He is no punk. He is no true timid individual, but he is now no longer serving the other side, but he's serving Christ's mission in this frame of work. And so he says, look, I, I, I timid uh, when face to face with you, but bold toward you went away. I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be towards some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. Here's the thing. It's time to step in, lean in, and become more aggressive than we are. Now, oftentimes we think of aggression in the way of getting hot under the collar, a saying four letter and foreign words. We, we think that aggression is to be a, a raspy or brass or harsh in our uh, vocal chords, but I'm not talking about that kind of aggression. The type of aggression I'm talking about is a holy aggression. I'm not talking about a holy aggression, but yes, a ha, 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 ha holy aggression. It is time to move with a purpose as it pertains to being a believer of Jesus Christ. What am I saying? I'm saying it is a time for us to carry the fight to where it needs to be. Just today as I uh, was uh, befuddled uh, and I uh, wanted to go into the international market. And as I was going into the international market, the Lord saw fit that I pulled up on the parking lot and I was able uh, to get a parking space right in the front of the international market. Now I'm at the international market, so there are all types of persons from different countries, colors, and creeds that are in and walking in and out of the international market. But my to my surprise, who is on the parking lot of the international market on this day of the Lord, uh, Wednesday, April the 10th, 2024, somewhere between the time of 4.45 p.m. and 5.15 p.m., but uh, five uh, Caucasian uh, Jesus Christ Latter-day Saint brothers with their uh, white shirt, black pants, and and ties and they are out there working the parking lot of the international market and I know how to pay attention but also move in the direction of what I need to do and I noticed something I noticed that all of the persons who could be considered Africans in America not Africans but Africans in America they did not approach us they didn't talk to us, but they talk to uh, the Hispanic population. They talk to the African 
African population. And as I walked into the international market, I even uh, leaned my ear in while still walking uh, forward and noticed that they not only spoke their language, but they began to speak uh, some Swahili to the African sister. They were speaking uh, Spanish to the African brother because uh, the, the Hispanic brother, because the Hispanic brother first didn't want to talk to him, but when he spoke his language, he turned around and talked to this Caucasian brother. They were out there with their Bibles in their hand. What I'm saying is they took the fight to the parking lot of the international market. Now, uh, let me be fair with them. Maybe they didn't talk to me. Maybe I just happened to what? Look like somebody's preacher getting out of my Cadillac, putting my uh, burgundy hat on and stepping with purpose into the store. Maybe I didn't look like I needed to know Jesus. Maybe I didn't look like I would become potentially a latter day saint. But in aggressive manner, they were not in their four walls. They were not in the place where they spread the message of the latter day saints. They were out in the open. And they were taking the message to where they felt it needed to be. But I wasn't done. I wasn't done with my observation because I said, maybe I'm just a being too absurd in my, in my estimation and assessment. But when I left out of the store and I began to really take notice of what was going on, on, I continue to pay attention to the fact uh, that they didn't just avoid me coming in, but when I walked out, them jokers went the other way. They did not want to speak to me. Maybe they knew something that I did not know, but I probably would have gave them a handful and more than their money was worth. But as I continue to assess the parking lot, I noticed that they walked past the other African African Americans who were approaching, I continued to assess and notice that there was a group of young people that were at the Starbucks coffee shop just hanging, not even doing anything malicious. Do you know the Latter-day Saints did not talk to the young people outside of the coffee shop? So it just pricked my heart and my soul. I said, I need to go and talk to these young people outside of the coffee shop. And I walked over and I just said, look, the Latter-day Saints walked past y'all, but I just want to know, do y'all know a man named Jesus? You don't have to give me no money. You don't have to come and go with me, but I just want to know, do you know a man named Jesus? If you don't know him, he died for your sins. If you don't have a church home, I can tell you where one is. Two of the young people said, no, I go to church. I go to this one over here. Another one said, no, I go to Reed Temple because it wasn't far from home. And I said, well, praise the Lord. I just want to make sure that y'all can connect and get to know the Lord. And I said, all of y'all who don't go to church and don't know the Lord, do me a favor and go to church with one of your friends this Sunday. And they said, you know what, preach, we going to do just that. I'm saying this to say that oftentimes we walk past our own people. We walk past our own color. We walk past our own kindred. And we don't ensure that their soul salvation is intact. We have to begin to have the boldness and the aggression of the Latter-day Saint to go to the parking lot where we may not be welcome. We may not be invited, but were you there? What did you do? How did you share the gospel? Yes, even yes, we should have the boldness to want to thrust out, even as the Jehovah Witness do go and knock on doors and they don't know who's on the other side of it only for the sole purpose to share a message about the Lord. 
Now, I'll tell you, I have given the Jehovah Witnesses a run for their money on more than one occasion. They don't come to my door no more. Not because I was mean to them, not because I was I was unkind to them, but I simply opened the door and said, oh, you want to talk? Well, let's open the Bible. Let's have discussion. I know the Lord. I love to talk about. I love to talk about the word. Where where would you like to go? What would you? Oh, no, we 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 all right. We 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 just. <laughs> well, you know them. We, we all right. See, they don't want to talk because uh, they're after some persons that know nothing so that they can simply uh, push their jargon into them and onto them. But see, if you're really one who is about sharing the gospel, you should have no trouble. You should have no problem saying, you know what? Let's sit. Let's dialogue. Let's break bread and not a piece of chicken and a biscuit, but let's break bread over this holy word together. We need to be a little more aggressive and that's what Paul is doing here. But make sure that you have the right spirit. See, when you're targeting certain demographics and you're targeting certain skin colors and you're targeting certain economic uh, valuations, you don't have the right spirit. See, the spirit of Christ is the right spirit to have. Look at Paul's wording. He says meekness. Meekness equals submission to God. Meekness does not make you soft in the sense or the hood vernacular that we use it in, that you are soft and people can get anything over on you. No, meekness, my brother, meekness, my sister, is a sign of strength and meekness shows submission to God. That is his strength. Meekness is not weakness. Gentleness equals an outward expression of meekness. Just because you're gentle, just because you're kind does not mean that you simply are a pushover. Paul was nobody's pushover. But because he is now working for the Lord, he operates in meekness. He expresses in gentleness, which is an outward expression of meekness. Gentleness does not mean a lack of toughness or or anything of that sort. He's operating in meekness. He's operating in gentleness, but he's also operating in boldness. And bold does not mean disrespectful. Bold does not mean arrogant. Bold does not mean nasty. Bold does not mean let me tell you a thing or two about a thing or two. No, boldness is equal to confidence. Paul is meek, he is gentle, yet he is bold. He exudes the confidence of Christ. And many Corinthians, as we look at the text, have been swept away by the Judaizers, uh, dynamic personalities and letters of recommendation because they are folks that can write real well. And there are some folk that can talk real well, but they ain't talking about nothing. They ain't writing about nothing. There's some folk that can buy you out of your hind pots. And I mean that in several different ways. But they are not truly benefiting you in any way. Because if someone pays you for the essence of what you have, they are not doing anything but robbing you. That's why we have to operate in a manner of aggressive posture, be gentle, be meek, but yet be bold because we have a generation who thinks that they can make it in this world by selling themselves and them souls to only fans or fans only or fansly or whatever the other uh, applications are, even downright to the YouTubes and the Instagrams. And there may be some persons that say, I don't know what that that is, but there are some people that know what that is because you paid for it. I won't go further. 
But guess what? It is destroying our people. It is destroying the future generation. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Uh, I am a bit vexed and fearful that my child, my children are not ready for war. They're not ready to be without their technological devices. They're not ready to be without the access to the fast food store. They're not ready for the 7-Eleven to be closed down and they can't get a hot dog or a taquito or whatever it is that you get there. They're not ready for the Wi-Fi to no longer work. They're not ready for the train to no longer operate. Many of them in the upcoming generation don't know how to make a meal out of a can of beans. They don't know the real understanding of how to ration anything. They don't know if I can be graphic, but not too graphic, how to wash their drawers out in the sink. I'm sorry, maybe that's too deep for some. Undergarments, underoos, and hang them. They don't know how to do these basic things. And some would say, well, why would they need to know? Because spiritual war is happening, but there is also a human war that is transpiring. And I don't know the day nor the time when it's coming. But guess what, my brother, my sister, this country does have enemies. And they are lying and waiting for the moment to strike. Do you believe that it's by happenstance that we have too many couch potatoes in this generation? Do you think it's by happenstance that we have too many of our young people that have no desire to want to speak another language? It is on purpose that a lot of these things are happening. We must pay attention to the signs of the time. We got to a point in place where as a people, as an African-American people, we began to celebrate the fact that the oppressors that we once had during the time of slavery are no longer the majority in this country, but cannot open our eyes, neither are we. We are very fastly becoming a minority in a place that we so proudly like to tout that this country was built on the back of our ancestors. But yet we're swiftly being pushed out. We're swiftly being taken asunder. That is why I stand proudly on my pastoral soapbox and I continue to boldly and prominently and aggressively with meekness, gentleness, but yes, boldness say that we need more of our men and women, our young men and our young women to be comprehensive thinkers. We need more of them to be mathematicians. We need more of them going into the pharmaceutical industry industries. We need more of them going into the medical practices. We need more of them going into the automechanic fields. We need more of them going into the fuel industries. We need more of them going into uh, the chemistry industry. We need more of them going into the biological industries. We need more of them going into the industries of anatomy and physiology 
theology. We need more of our people to be represented in the places that we have a need. Because can I just tell you a secret that's not so secret that each and every one of you know? It gets alarming and it gets very daunting when you go to get help for your body by somebody that don't look nothing like you. Because let's be real, they can't help you most of the time. I never shall forget, I had a wonderful Middle Eastern doctor and while I was in the midst and the throngs of, of wanting to, and desiring to lose weight and wanting to no longer be on any manner of insulin or diabetic uh, medicine, she looked at me and said, have you ever tried the South Beach diet? I said, does this body look like it's South Beach? No, ma'am. She was trying her best, but it was not until I was able to sit in front of an allergist who was my skin color, an allergist who had grown up in houses where ham hocks and chitterlings and fat backs and greens and things were made, an allergist who was able to dissect and explain to me the anatomy of my body, an allergist who was able to prick and poke me and not just tell me what I was allergic to but tell me why based on where I was from where I come from where I hail from what I'm allergic to why I'm allergic to it and how persons of this color hue with these kind of body structures and styles that are not just full of fat but full of inflammation need not do the following things in order to help but it did not ring true, it did not ring a bell until I was what? In front of someone who could directly resonate with me. Not someone who was just going to simply tell me, try to eat one piece of fried chicken. Honey, do you know the special that they got at Popeye's say eight pieces? And by the time I get that eight, pieces. I'm going to have five of them. Don't tell me. But here's the thing. We have to get aggressive with taking the war where it needs to be. And the war is happening all around us. Our enemy is meticulous. Our enemy is calculated. Our enemy is divisive because the war is not just with our food. The war is not just with our bodies. The war is not just with our minds. The war is at the essence of creation. Abortions are rampant in our communities. Abortion clinics are in our communities. Abortion drugs are prevalent and running rampant in our communities. Because the enemy is of the mindset that not only if I can get you to turn against the Lord, can I take you out of here? But also, if I can get you to kill creation, then creation will stop. Because many times we get to this place and this point where we just want to argue from the Democratic or the Republican side of the house when we really need to come and pay a little more close attention to that pro-life conversation and have an understanding that when we deal with the manners of abortion, we are dealing with it from the aspect of destroying creation. We are dealing with it from the aspect of saying that life ends. We have to begin to stop looking at it as a mistake. Yes, I do believe that we do have to have the very serious conversation of telling folk that they need to keep their private parts to their privates and not go intermingling them until they are ready to deal with real life adult situations. But... If we don't occupy their minds as we once did, 
See, we haven't even done these style of lectures in quite some time because we've gotten too consumed with the lives that we live and the lives that we had. See, I'm saying that the church has to be aggressive because guess what? When we had revivals, revivals used to be five nights, not two, not three, but five. Revival started right when you got off work, right when you got out of school. Matter of fact, the revivals had a carpools with them and sometimes your children met you at revival. There was BTU that kept you in training, Bible training unit. The church was prevalent, the church was prime, but here it is, we come to the place of not understanding that we are in war, and if we are not in the place that we can be equipped to fight the war and wage the war properly, what happens? We lose the war because we're not assembling in the gathering of the saints. We're not coming into the Sunday school. We're not coming into the Bible study. We're not getting onto the prayer line. We won't come to the lectures. We don't have time to make it to spring revival, but we have time to go on the shopping trip. We have time to go for margaritas and mimosas. We have time to go for a bourbon and beef tastings. We have time to go. But when do we make time for the Lord? War is not waiting for us. War is upon us. War is amongst us. And we need to have the right spirit in order to deal with the war that we are in. Paul is firing back. Paul is getting right into the face of the Corinthians to let them know that the wages of sin are death. We need to be aggressive. We need to be direct. We need to stop ignoring our children and our grandchildren and our nieces and our nephews. We need to stop placing electronic devices and hey, 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 hey. I'm not just talking to you. I'm talking right where I stand right now. I have a 20 something year old. I have a 10 year old. I have two, three year olds. I'm talking about what I see. We have to stop relegating them to their electronic and technological devices and letting them go for hours at a time without social and human engagement. Because guess what? It does, as we have heard, as we have said, as we have preached, as you all have administered in your own, it starts at home. It starts at home where you learn how to talk, where you learn how to speak, where you learn how to stand, where you learn how to engage people. I never shall forget, I used to have to learn how to ask for things. I could not just simply say, can I get some water? Guess what? I would be quicker popped in the mouth. If I said, can I get some water? Y'all can ask some potions there. No, I had to say, excuse me, may I ha please have a cool glass of water? That is how I had to request it in the four walls of the ghetto home. Didn't matter that there was ghetto on the outside. What matter is what the training ground was on the inside. Because we have to ensure that we are training our children, our grandchildren, our nieces and our nephews, not for what's right out the door, but for where they have the opportunity and the ability to go. Not even just merely for the limitations that you have experienced. And that does not mean that you haven't gone anywhere, but it does mean that there are less moons in your life 
than there are for those that come behind you and we have to prepare them to be in places and rooms and languages and people that we may not have experienced before. There is a war and the war must be waged. We must hit it with aggression. We must not deal with it from the standpoint of just simply saying, eh, they'll get it when they get there. The military spends billions of dollars. They don't just drop the troops in foreign countries and say, figure it out. When you get there, no, they spend billions of dollars in simulations and training facilities and training camps and going through all kinds of physical and cognitive and, and sensory training, all kinds of, of physical tests preparing them. They, they, they go through all manners of simulations preparing them for the places that they will put them so that when their boots hit the ground, they are ready to do the work. They don't just haphazardly say, figure it out, because that's not how wars are won. No, you have to have the right attitude. We have to be aggressive. We have to know that the enemy attacks in varied ways and forms and he has no friends. He has no allegiance to anyone. He's just seeking to destroy, to devour. We have to be aggressive. We have to also be armed. Paul wasn't living by the world's standards. You and I, my brothers and sisters, even if we come to this place at 659 on April the 10th of the year 2024, I speak into your hearing that we cannot live continually by the world's standards. If you and I continue to live by the world's standards instead of God's standard, we will be destroyed. Paul recognizes and he is under the impression that he is not going for war, preparing for war, but he is engaged in war. The word war denotes a full-fledged campaign against evil and we are in a full-fledged campaign against evil satan is out to divide to destroy the war calls for us to take up divine power to place on divine armor as Ephesians 6, 10 through 18 tell us because we are a divine creation, we have to come to a place where we understand that we battle against the satanic strongholds, fortresses where evil becomes entrenched. Our weapons can be consumed if they are worldly weapons. The Second Amendment only deals and helps us in this world. But the Second Amendment does not help us in the spiritual world. When demons come to your doorsteps, you can't go get your pistol and load it and shoot them. You don't have enough bullets. There's not enough ammunition in the gun store. There's not enough ammunition in the warehouse. Remember when Jesus got to the man that was demon possessed, he said, what? My name is Legion and there are many. The demons are many. We are in warfare. We have to be armed properly. And not only do we must we be aggressive, must we be armed properly, but we must aim correctly. What am I saying as I hasten to my close in the midst of this lecture that we're aiming at one another? 
We're aiming at our own kin. We're aiming at our own bloodline. We're aiming at the people who look like us, who talk like us, who smell like us, who came from where we came. We're aiming in the wrong direction. When we look at the news, we're seeing too many folk that look like us dying. I don't know about you, but I've been to too many jailhouses and I see more folk in the jailhouse that look like me than anybody else. We're aiming incorrectly. We have to aim and ensure that our aim is of truth, that our aim is of God, and our aim is applied by the Spirit of God as Ephesians 4.17 encourages us. Paul traces every sinful act back to a psychological origin. How does Satan get a stronghold? He does it through the mind. That's why we have to ensure that we stop allowing our children to be consumed with technological devices. Because guess what? When we give them a phone, watch this. They don't have access to the world. See, that's the falsehood that we've been taught. Give them technology. Give them access so they can have access to the world. No. When we put technology in their hands, the world has access to them. When our children are on these gaming devices and they are communicating and playing games with people all across the world who are speaking different languages, there are people, read the reports. These reports don't come in the news. You got to read these reports. You got to dig for these reports where our black and brown children are being persuaded and guided by people in other countries to kill themselves by way of suicide, by people in other countries to murder folks in their homes homes because they're on these gaming devices where their headsets are on, where they have blocked out the world. And now they have a technological device that not only do you put something on your head, but now you put something over your mouth that blocks out sound where you can scream out. So even in fact, if something gets to a place and point that it gets so secured, you may not even hear your child holler for help. Because their mouth has been muzzled like an animal. Because we've given them technology and we think that we've given them access to the world. But we've given the world access to them. And guess what? The world enjoys it because they are not equipped to handle the world. And guess what? The world knows that they are not equipped to handle the world. A child was just asked online a little while ago, did they know the alphabet? And they said, yes. And the person said, how many numbers are in the alphabet? Do you know they tried to figure it out? Others people laughed. I could not laugh because it was a Caucasian person asking the question and it was a black child who could not come up with the answer. And that was indicative. That was the example of that of what we are faced with right now. Oftentimes we become consumed in watching these persons such as Medea and Tyler Perry who dresses as Medea and makes fun of, of distorting the scriptures. And I'll tell you, I laughed in the beginning when I first saw it, but there is nothing funny about making fun of the gospel. There is nothing fun about laughing at someone not know who Jonah is and what Jonah went through. There is nothing fun about a laughing about what it is that Noah was able to accomplish. 
There is nothing fun or funny about it because guess what? The people that are making fun of it know the story, but they are doing it toward people that have no understanding of what it really is. And guess where the danger comes in? No, I know. Don't attack me. I'm not saying go home and throw all of your DVDs away. Well, yes, I am. But no, I'm not. You paid for it, not me. But what I am saying is, watch this, pay attention to this. The people who are making fun of it know what the true story is, but they're making fun of it towards people who have no idea what the true story is. So then the people who don't know what the true story is, is taking the funny version of it and making Making it true. And that is the warfare that we're in. That is why the church can no longer be dormant. That is why the church cannot continue to sleep at the wheel. That is why the church must stand firm and flat footed and tell the world about this man named Jesus. That is why Paul did the work that he did, even though they knew who he was. Paul said, I have to do this work because I no longer am who I was. Paul traces every sinful act back to the psychological origin of man. That's how Satan gets his stronghold by getting a hold of the mind. We have heard all the battle for the bottle and the and the Bible happens in the brain. And if the enemy takes hold of the brain at the time of your child's bottle, we are severely in danger of losing the war. Here it is. We must come to the place where we understand that we are waging war and we must put on the full armor of God. And by doing that, we must champion the truth. We must be strengthened by the spirit of God. We must be armed with the word of God. We must carry the fight to the enemy and stop waiting for the enemy to attempt to draw first blood. Because my brothers and sisters, the enemy has already drawn first blood. We have to stop bleeding out. And we have to carry the fight directly to him, not by trying to beat him, not by trying to fight him, but we have to carry it to him by way of the gospel. We have to carry it to him by way of the songs of Zion. Satan, we're going to tear your kingdom down. You've been building your kingdom all over this town. Satan, we're going to tear your kingdom down. Satan, we're going to shout your kingdom down. You've been building your kingdom all over this town and Satan, we're going to shout your kingdom down. The hymn writer says, Satan, we're going to pray your kingdom down. You've been building your kingdom all over this town. Satan, we're going to pray your kingdom down. Satan, we're going to sing your kingdom down. You've been building your kingdom all over this town. Satan, we're going to uh, sing your kingdom down. Satan, we're going to stop your kingdom down. You've been building your kingdom all over this town. Satan, we're going to stomp your kingdom down. We are supposed to be waging war as believers, and we are not alone. Look to your left. Look to your right. I don't have to extend the invitation right now at this moment because everybody in here from what I see and have an understanding of is saved. So we're all supposed to be on the same side. And none of us are supposed to be alone. 
God bless you. We are now move and transition into our time and service of revival. The choir will begin to get assembled. We'll now look to those on our deacon and deaconess ministry to come at this time and begin our uh, moments of devotion. Amen. Okay, good evening, everyone. We're going to begin our devotional period at this time. If we can all come to order, please. Now I'm going to start with the scripture. I'm going to read for our hearing Psalm 149. If we can all come to order, please. Thank you so much. Psalm 149. Praise ye the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song, and his praise in the congregation of saints. Let Israel rejoice in him that made him. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name in the dance. Let them sing praises unto him with the timbrel and harp. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beards. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and the two-edged sword in their hand. To execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people. To bind the kings with chains and the nobles with fetters of iron. To execute upon them the judgment written, this honor have all his saints. Praise ye the Lord. Amen. 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 
Shall we pray? Father, once again, we just come and say thank you. Thank you for being so good and merciful. Allowing us to lay down last night, sleep and slumber, and you woke us up this morning and started us on our way. And we just want to say thank you. Then we want to say thank you for allowing us to come out for the revival tonight. Because this shows that we trust and believe in you. And a revival is helping among anybody because we might not know who might be going through something. There might be something said, might be a song sung or something that might help you along the way. Let the Lord continue to lead, direct, and guide you and bless you. And all these blessings I ask in your name. Amen. Why don't you come on in this house? Why? So I'm so thankful for those who are here right now and praying the more be on their way. Anyone have a heart on your song, I mean, a song with your heart? You just, just want to <laughs> come out with it right now. You feel free to do so. And if you got a heart on your song, that's fine too. Just whatever it is, bring it out. Amen. Should be, but I'm grateful that He. 
song or a testimony you want to share tonight. The floor is open. There will be one. A little bit of time left. Would there be another? I'm going to try a little bit of something I've never done it before, but it's always. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Thank you. Well, you saved me. I want to thank and praise the Lord that have been taking care of me the last, the, last, the last couple of months. I was going through a, you know, a terrible uh, setback. Uh, not only my health, and not only that, I end up downsizing. Uh, and I just just moved on because I end up um, just basically just just having to give 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 all my stuff away. You know, I try to sell it, but you, you ain't gonna try to sell nothing. Cause ain't nobody gonna sell it. You sell it, you're gonna have to take it to the people and all that. But nevertheless, I I just gave all most of it away. And not only that, the guy that bought my house, he um uh, he um uh, told me anything I don't want, he can just leave it there. And I just bought everything. You know, I left, I left bedroom, sofa, pool table. And, uh, but nevertheless, I just want to continue to thank God because like I say, he been with me all my life and I know this. And so I just got to keep on moving forward and praising him and thanking him all the time. And, you know, that's my um, testimony. Amen. Thank you, Brother Cordy. 
I'm not gonna, I don't wanna share anybody else. Anybody else have anything you'd like to share tonight? Song in your heart, testimony? Okay, if not, then we're gonna bring this to an end of this time. Why we take the choir stand, I'll turn this over to Pastor Blue. Thank you so much. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Come on, stand on your feet. Let's give the Lord a praise in this house. Let's give the Lord a praise in this place. This is yet another day. Not only that the Lord has made, that the Lord has allowed us to exist in. Are you breathing right now? Are the, is the blood running in your vein? Are you able to put your hands together? Open up your mouth and just give God praise in this holy place. Certainly the Lord is good and he is worthy to be praised. We are in our spring revival and I pray that you came expecting something. I pray that you tuned in expecting something anytime we come into the household of worship. Anytime we come and assemble to hear that of what the good news is. We should have an expectation that God will do not the same thing, but that he will do something new, something that will encourage and edify our very hearts, souls, and bodies. I thank God that you're here on today. I thank God that we've been able to make it thus far. I praise the Lord for the opportunity to be here in this time of revival on tonight. Won't you pray with me? A merciful master, righteous redeemer, we thank you for this opportunity to come into revival. Master, we pray that your spirit would move by your might, by your power. Lord, we thank you for the food that has been received. Lord, we thank you for the lecture that has been rendered. Lord, we thank you for the devotions that have gone forward. God, we thank you for the testimonies that have been given aloud and the testimonies that have been lifted from the very essence and depths of our hearts and souls and just having a grateful and joyful heart for all that you have done for us that we have not deserved nor that we have the ability to afford. Master, we just thank you. And we ask that you would have your way in this place, that you would have your way with the preacher that will come, that you would have your way with the songs of Zion that are lifted, that you would move and that we would experience you. It's in Jesus' name we say thank you and amen. As we remain standing for a moment, let us lift with the choir our opening hymn on this first night of revival. Revive us again. Amen. Amen.
seated in the presence of the Lord. Uh, Sister Portia Blue will come with our welcome, and then we'll come and hear a selection from the combined choir. Praise the Lord, church. Praise the Lord, Praise the Lord church. Praise the Lord. We come to have revival this evening. Good evening, giving honor to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Pastor Blue Sr., Reverend Pender Sr., Blanchard, and all distinguished guests, family and friends. Welcome. Would all visitors please stand? We have none. We claim them all. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let us be revived this evening. Amen. It's tough. I know what you're going through, but is the Lord taking care of you? Amen. 
Certainly, as we are in the midst of our worship experience for this first night of revival, we come to our time of giving, and certainly we know that the Lord has done great things for us, and so we want to continue to be a blessing. Uh, certainly, on tonight, we have uh, for revival each of our own in both nights. Tonight, it is going to be that of Reverend Simon Pender, Jr., and so we're going to raise an offering for the church and raise a love offering for our revivalist uh, and, and and we are we, we are persons who who know uh, that uh, this this servant of the Lord can preach and will preach so I don't have to wait till after he preaches to lift the offering somebody say amen, amen. so we're going to be a blessing unto him uh, and we're going to get offerings in our uh, in our hand I'm going to ask that uh, Trustee Catlett will come. Trustee Askew will come. They are going to uh, come to the front. Uh, Trustee Askew will be holding the plate for our revivalist on tonight, Reverend Pender. Trustee Catlett will be holding the plate for uh, the church. Amen. And let us come. Uh, if you have your offering, uh, place love offering, place church. If you have uh, done your envelope, certainly identify on your envelope that of where uh, you would have them go. Let us be a blessing to the revivalists. Let us be a blessing uh, to the household of worship and faith known as St. Matthew's Baptist Church. Amen. Amen. We're going to look to uh, be instructed uh, by the ushers uh, that will come and direct us uh, to move around the sanctuary. And the choir will uh, encourage our souls uh, by lifting their uh, voices so that we might come and give uh, joyfully and generously. Amen. Amen. We're now in the hands of the choir and our ushers.
come of thee, O Lord, and of thine own have we given thee. giving on uh, tonight. Uh, certainly on this first night of revival, we are uh, moving and moving in a good form, fashion, and pace. Uh, it's time for the preaching. Amen. Anybody come to hear a word from the Lord on tonight? It's time for the preaching. And certainly the preacher on tonight, as the program says, simply just needs to be presented, does not need an introduction. He is going to preach. He knows how to preach. He has been teaching preachers and pastors how to preach for decades. He is the former vice president of the D.C. Bible Institute. He is ordained. He is appointed. He is anointed. He just happens to also be my father-in-law. Amen. And so I'm gratefully indebted to him because of him. I have my wife. Amen. And so I thank the Lord for him personally. I thank the Lord for him spiritually. He is one of the associate members ministers of this household of worship and faith. And so I present to you the Reverend Simon Pender Jr. Hear ye him for his God-given grace and ability following this song of preparation from the combined choir. Amen. Amen.
singing as they magnify the Lord. Amen. And the Bible says that everything that has breath praise the Lord. And they have done that. Amen. And you have done that because you we had some great teaching tonight. That's a great seminar. And we need to take it and use it. Amen. Amen. Because it's good for us. Amen. Amen. And I, I want my, my text tonight is, is, is going to be praying and praising in the king house. Amen. Praising and praying in the king's house. And my text will be taken from Daniel, one of the major prophets of the Bible, of the Old Testament. And we'll be looking at chapter 6. Amen. Daniel is a great warrior for the Lord. When he and his, his, his friends, when the Babylonians came to Jerusalem and, and destroyed it, they took the best of everything back to 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 uh, to, to Babylon with them, and 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 four of the guys, young fellows that they took, you you know them very well: Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel. Amen. Because they were smart. That's what we were talking about this tonight. They were very intelligent, and what and what what the Babylon would do, they took all the great things, all the great people, smart people, and they took them back to Babylon, and they trained them in the way of the Babylonians, amen. amen. But it was four; mm -hmm. they couldn't change their mind, amen. amen. And let's, I'm gonna begin reading at chapter six, verse one, and it please. Darius, or Darius, to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom. And over these three governors, of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. Then, here's the key, then this Daniel distinguished himself above all the governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king gave him thought to set him over the whole kingdom, a whole ring, 
Now, Daniel is a, is a Hebrew. He's a Jewish boy. The other side crabs are not Jewish boy. They are they, they, they are they are they are they are um they are me and um they're 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 they're, they're under the, the king Darius because they took the kingdom they they they, they took the, the uh, Babylonian they took Israel or Judah back to Babylonia and they were they were teaching them the way of the Babylonians but they couldn't teach Daniel that way. They couldn't take Shadrach and Meshach that way because they knew God. But so the, what the king is doing, he said, what I'm going to do, since Daniel is smart and rest of these jokers, mm -hmm. amen, he said, I'm going to take Daniel and put him over all the affairs of the king. Because mm -hmm. the king didn't want to lose no money now. He didn't want, no, he didn't want, he didn't want the treasure to deplete itself. Uh -huh. He's not knowing about it. So he put Daniel over the whole, over the whole kingdom, all the finances. He making his cabinet, amen. Yeah. And so the governors, verse four, and the satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could not find no charge or fault. Because he was what? Faithful. And what else? Nor was there any area of fault found in him. These men said, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of God. So the governor and the satraps thrown before king the king and said to thus to king to him king Darius live forever they come in line see mm -hmm. but they got when you when you come in, in for, come before the king you've got to greet him just like we come before uh, president joe Biden. you would you would call him president mm -hmm. amen so the governors verse seven all the governors in the kingdom the administrators sat trap the counselor advisor had consulted together to establish a royal statute to make a firm decree that whosoever petition any god or man for 30 days, except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree, sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persia, which does not alter or cannot be changed. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. Now, when Daniel knew that the writer was signed, he went home and in his upper room with his windows open towards Jerusalem. He kneeled down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God. And, and, and it was his custom every er, since early day, since his early days. Now Daniel, Daniel didn't try to be polit political correct. Amen. Daniel called things that he saw them. Uh -huh. He called things that God told him to call them and went on by his business. And he said, whatever happened, mm -hmm. it's in God's hand. Amen? Amen. But see, the king knew Daniel's capability. The king knew that the spirit of God was, died, was God in Daniel not to obey the decree and that the liars and the princes had put together so the king was signing. But Daniel had an extra spirit in him. Mm -hmm. And the king thought to set him over the ring. See, people, when you live for the Lord, people see that you have God in, in you. Amen? If you live for the Lord now. Now, if you're on your job and you, and, and, and you, and you, and you know the Lord 
and do what the Lord said do, the Lord will take care of you. Amen? Amen? And you want promotion? The Lord can provide one for you. Yeah. Amen? But you can't live like the world one day and live like a child of God the next day. But see, Daniel continually yeah. worshiped and praised the God of heaven. And the king knew this. Amen? Amen? The king saw he was the right man for the job. The other boys wasn't ready. Amen? Right yeah, they weren't ready yet. yet. Because see, they had their mind on the treasure. Mm -hmm. They had their mind on trying to, to, to take things that the king would know. But he knew if he put Daniel there, Daniel would tell everything that's going on. Uh -huh. Amen? Yeah. And the king saw the selfishness of the other princes. And they didn't have an extra spirit in them. They aligned themselves with the devil. And whenever you align yourself with the devil, it's not good news. Amen? 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 Daniel pressed his way through. And God had something waiting on him. Amen? Like he have on us. If we press our way through, God have some waiting on us on the other side. Amen? Yeah. So, but Daniel went to his house like he always did. Got on his knees and prayed. Giving thanks before God and he, did, and he often did. See, when man's law conflicts with God's law, we ought to obey God's law. Amen? And that's what Daniel did. See, yeah. see, see, see. Because God had us in his house of his hand. That's right. Not only did he have the king's hand in the house of his hand, and he could turn the king's hand whichever way he wanted to turn it. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. See, Daniel didn't try to get out of being put in the lion's den. I believe he prayed the Lord all the way to the lion's den. Mm -hmm. He didn't. He didn't come hollering, screaming, King. The King knew Daniel, and Daniel knew the King. Yeah. Amen. Amen. See, the, the, see, God had Daniel back, and He will have our backs when we're in trouble. Amen. Amen. I beat Daniel man told the king, whenever you're ready, I'm ready. Mm. Amen. Whenever you're ready, I'm ready because I'm in God's hand. And the, and the king knew Daniel was in God's hand. But, but the thing that the king said, the king said, the God whom you serve continually, continually, he will deliver you. Amen. See, we, when we serve God continually, he'll fight our battles. Yes, he will. He'll give us, give us strength yes, he will. to handle our battles. And that's what Daniel did. All the great prophets, all the great men and women of the Bible, they spent time with the Lord. Yeah. Amen? They read God's word. Amen? Yes, he did. Amen. Amen. See, when things are at their worst, God is at his best. Bye-bye. Amen. When things are at their worst, God is at his best. Uh -huh. See, see, the pit, putting down the line then won't nothing for God. Amen. Because he's going to take care of Daniel's the line then. But Daniel was serving a living God, not a dead God. Yes. See, the, the Babylonians served out of God. And they thought their God was stronger than Daniel's God. Uh -huh. But God made the heaven and the earth and he can speak and time will stand still. Mm. Amen. See, Daniel was a stranger in a foreign land yes, he but he still could sing. He still could praise and sing the song of Zion. The yeah. When the Bab son of the captives in, in Babylon, they took him to, to back to Babylon and the people would tell them, I think that's in Ezekiel, he told the people would ask Daniel them said, why don't, not, not Daniel, but some of the captives, why not sing us some of those, those nice songs that y'all sing? Sing the song. And they told the people, we can't sing those songs because mm -hmm. we're not in Babylon. That's what they were saying. But see, if you know God, you can sing anywhere. Anywhere. Amen? Yeah. People in jail pray. Yeah. 
I've been to the jail when they were praying. I've been to the jail when they were teaching. God is everywhere. Everything. Amen. Because he made heaven and earth. Amen. But it didn't bother Daniel about being in a foreign land. When the, when the Babylonians found out that Daniel, when the, when the false leaders found out Daniel was on God's side, they said, we got to get rid of him. Mm -hmm. But God said, he's my man. He stayed in touch with the Lord, and we have to do the same thing. Amen? Yeah. I believe Daniel was singing the Lord's song all the way to the lion's den. Amen? Yeah. Singing and praising. Amen? The lions may have been Daniel pillow and put Daniel to sleep. He slept on the line, on the line in the lion's den. Amen? One thing we do know, God was in the lion's den. Yes, he was. Amen? He shut the mouths of the lions. Yes, he did. Amen. Because anybody else that they, they, they had thrown at the lion was even before, even and tear them apart before they hit the bottom of the pit. That's it. But these three Hebrew boys, along with Daniel, prayed in jail. Amen. Amen. When our when our children is away from us in college or wherever, we need to pray for them. Pray for them. Amen. Don't don't never go to sleep at night without praying for them. And pray for them during the day. Whenever they come on your mind, you pray for them. Amen. See, Paul and Silas sung in jail and pray. Amen. Amen. See, we we, we serve a law a, a, a law that's faithful to Daniel, and he's faithful to us. God will turn our lion dens into a blessing. Yes, he will. Amen? Just as Job. Just as Paul. Just as Peter. As Jeremiah and John. Pastor. Amen. Pastor. Paul, Paul, Paul had, a, had, a, had to go to Rome on a ship. Mm -hmm. that, was ship that, got, that got to be that had the ship be shipwrecked. But Paul told the boys. He said, look, he told the soldiers, he told everybody on the ship, if you stay aboard the ship, stay aboard. you won't lose a hair on your head. Mm. Amen. See, we have to stay in the ship, church. Even when things are going bad, yeah. stay in the ship. Stay in the ship. And you know what? The ship got the wrong. But Paul had told them, so look, I met with God last night. Yeah. And he told me, he said, look, you tell everybody on the ship, when we get close to shore, when we're shipwrecked, grab anything you can and make it to shore. And, and they did just that. Not one soul was lost because they stayed in the ship. Stayed in the ship. And Paul knew the Lord. Amen? Paul had a job to do. We have a job to do. Just like Pastor Blue was talking about tonight. We have a job to do with our young folks. Don't talk about them. Talk to them. Amen. Amen. Tell them that God can do great things in your life if you let them. Amen. 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 When we serve the Lord faithful, like Daniel, God will turn our lives into blessings. The church can live and not compromise with the world. Mm -hmm. We have to be genuine and real, like Daniel. And and Darius to me, the king saw this in Daniel. Daniel was different. We have to be different. It doesn't mean that we walk around pious and, and, and talk and talk about law all day on the job. You didn't go down there to talk to the law on the job. You went down to the job to work. Amen? Amen. You go down there and work, and when people see you, they, you, they'll know that you're a child of God. And when they need uh, some help, they'll come to you. That's right. Because God will send them to you. Yes, he will. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Daniel was different from the other presidents. He was better than the best. He still above. He stood above the president. See, we might not get the promotion on the job that we deserve. Just hang in there. Hang in there. Amen. Uh, Tony Evans told the story about this. This one of, her, one of his church members. She was on the job, working hard, doing her job, and the boss tried to go with her. See, I tell you how you get a promotion. It's, on, it's your promotion. If you go to bed with me. Wow. 
Bye-bye. And she told him, said, I got a husband. Got a husband. And a family. And the dear sister went back to the job one day, and she ready, ready to go to work, and uh, got in the job, and the boss told her, said, uh, you know, you got a promotion this morning. Mm. She said, what? So you, got to, you got a promotion. The man that you said accused you, you got his job. Got his job. Amen? Just stay with the Lord. Stay with the Lord. Man. He'll bring you through. Amen? Yeah. See, the devil will try to get you, try you for your own Lord's side, but just stay in God's word. Yeah. Praise and prayer. Amen? They go together. Yes, they do. Amen? See, Shadrach, she, Meshach, and Abednego was teenagers teen when they went down to Babylon. But they prayed, they studied God's word, and they lived for the Lord. See, yeah. Jesus said you ought to be a light. Before the world. So they might see your what? Your good works. And when they see your good works, they'll glorify God. Amen. See, Satan will try you when you're old. He'll try it when you're young. He'll try it when you're middle aged. Amen. But if you study God's word, that's your help. Amen. Do what Paul said in Ephesians 6. Verse 10 through 12. Put on the whole armor of God. Yeah. Amen. Not just some, but the whole armor. The shield of faith. The sword of the spirit. Mm -hmm. The word of God. Mm -hmm. The helmet of salvation. The best plate of righteousness. Yes. Your feet shone with the preservation of the gospel of peace. Yes. Praying always with prayer. Amen. Oh. The Lord said, vengeance is mine, and I will repay. Amen. Those presidents and princes who conspired against Daniel got their just reward. Amen. And I'm going to read it to you. I'm going to read it to you. Then when Daniel, they brought Daniel out of line then, Daniel, 21 said, then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. Mm -hmm. My God sent his angels and shut the lion's mouth so that they would not hurt me because I was found innocent before him and also before you, O king. I have done no wrong before you. Now the king was exceedingly glad to see Daniel and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken him up out of the den, and no injury, whatever, was found on him, because he believed God. Amen. He believed who? God. Amen. And God do what? Fight your what? Fight your battle. Amen. And and here's the sad thing, the sad part about this. And the king gave the command that they brought those men who have accused Daniel and they cast them into the dens of the lion. Here's the sad part. Them, their children, their wives, amen, and, broke, and, and, and the lion broke all their bones in pieces, pieces before they came to the bottom of the pit. Then the king said, see, the king made a decree. The king daughters wrote to all the people and nations and language that dwell in, in the earth. Mm -hmm. Because he was the king, he was the ruler of the earth now. He was the top dog in the earth. Amen? Amen. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, this kingdom now, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. Mm. For he is the what? Living, Living God. God. And what? Steadfast forever. His kingdom is one which shall not be destroyed. Now, this is a pagan man yeah. saying this. Uh -huh. But he was a pagan man. Now he's a saved man because of how Daniel lived before him. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? His kingdom is one which shall not be destroyed. 
and his kingdom shall not, his kingdom shall endure to the end. Amen. Verse 27. He delivers and rescues, and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Whoever delivered, he, he, he had delivered Daniel mm -hmm. from the power of the lion. Yeah. So Daniel, verse 28, prospered in the reign of Darius the Mede, mm -hmm. in the reign of, of Cyprus the Persian. Amen? So what it says? It says what? Prayer, praise, yeah. in anybody's house. Yes, sir. And make sure you can pray and praise in your own house. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. And when you go to your lunch time, I used I used to study my Bible on lunch time, and uh, and uh, and uh, we would study. Sometimes we would have classes. Sometimes we had a Bible class at, at, at our job. But see, and I never forget one day, I went to went to a funeral, and 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 and, and, and my supervisor was supposed to make uh, greetings for the say so to the family. He looked at me, said, you do. I, ain't no problem, man. ain't no problem with me. Yeah. And I did it. But here's he, what I got. But a couple weeks later, I need a, a parking stick. Yeah. You hear me? And, uh, and, and I went to him. I said, I said, it's no parents. I said, I need a parking stick. I said, I had to take my daughter to school, the Evelyn school in the morning and go to work. He said, okay, Simon, don't worry about it. Got me a parking stick. Got the parking stick. <laughs> Another thing, we played on the same softball team too, so that helped too. But see, when you stay with the Lord, stay with the Lord. When you worship the Lord, He'll take care of the lion deals in your life. Amen. Yes, He will. See, all the wicked, all the wicked, and evil do will be rewarded one day by just God. Amen. The kingpins who sell drugs to our young folks, make prostitutes out of our young girls. God will reward them one day, one day with hell. Amen. The gay and lesbian movement gonna get watered one day if they don't change. You'll spend eternity in hell because God made who? Adam and Eve. The Lord is near those who call on his name. Yes, he is. That's what Daniel did. He prayed. Stand on God's word. He will bring you out of the lion's den. Jesus can handle all of our problems, all of our situations all of that the devil throws at us. Amen. Amen. We need to know Jesus. Not just about him. Not just put a book up. Yeah. Upside down. You got to read the book. Read it. And, 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 and in the Greek, the, the, the book, it means biblos. What it means is the book. The book. The, book. the Bible. Amen. Amen. There are a lot of books in 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 in, 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 in Babylon and throughout the, the different empire, but there was one book when they said the book, they were talking about the Bible. The Amen. Book. The book, the Biblos, the Word. Amen. We need to know Jesus, not just about Him. Amen. When we know Him, He knows us. That's it. Yeah. When you know Him, He knows you. He knows you. He knows your name. Yeah. Amen. 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 And Jesus is the answer for the world today. Amen. Yes, he is. Yeah. I'm finished, church. Amen. Amen. Prayer, praise in the king house, in your house. Amen. In jails, on your job, when it's time to pray and praise. Amen. Amen. That's what Daniel did. Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. 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 Let us stand. The doors of the church are open. Certainly let us give the Lord praise for the message and the messenger on tonight. Prayer and praise in the king's house. When you pray, when you praise, wherever you are, the preacher said it, God will take care of the lion's dens in your life if you make certain no matter what. You give him the praise and you stay rooted and grounded in your prayers. 
If you're here on tonight, we offer Christ to you. If you're here on tonight and you don't know the Lord, we offer Christ to you. If you're joining us in the virtual temple for revival on tonight and you don't know the Lord, type it in the chat. We offer Christ to you tonight. For we serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. And he does live. And if we want life everlasting, we must accept him as our Lord and Savior. And so for those of us who know the Lord tonight, let us continue to move about in this land below, telling men and women, boys and girls about a Savior, his name being Jesus, the one who died so that all might have right to the tree of life. So if you're here today, we invite you to come. You type it in the chat. We'll reach out to you. We thank the Lord for you. And your life is made living and worth the living because of his sacrifice on Calvary's cross. Amen. And amen. Thank you so much, Reverend Pender, for the word. Thank you so much for being here for our first night of revival, for the first night of lecturing. We thank the Lord asking that all of us would come back, come back and bring somebody with us on tomorrow night for our final night of Spring Revival 2024. Tomorrow's lecture is going to be Brother Mike Lee. Uh, the lecture is entitled Leverage and Legacy, the Power of 501c8 in wealth and philanthropy. I know there's some wealthy people in this room. There's some wealthy people online. I know you are. I'm looking at you. You are children of God. Yes. And you're wealthy. Thank you. And Brother Mike Lee is going to help us leverage the wealth that we don't even think we have, but we have. So won't you come to tomorrow night, 5.30, we'll get a light meal in, 6, we'll start our lecture, 7, we'll start revival, Reverend Blanchard will be our revivalist on tomorrow night, and following revival, we're going into prayer. I told them last night on prayer line, we're not canceling our corporate prayer. When we finish with revival, we're going into corporate prayer. So if you're not here, we're opening up Zoom, if you're here, we are going into corporate church prayer to end our spring 2024 revival. Amen? Amen. Amen. So be here on tomorrow night. Thank God for our culinary team served dinner on tonight. We thank God for our ushers on duty. Thank God for our deacons, our deaconesses. Can you give God praise for our combined choir on tonight? Thank you so much to Brother Cromwell for being here on tonight let us look in this way we'll have the final benediction on tomorrow night but let us chant out in this way would you boldly loudly repeat these words after me lord, lord send us a revival, us a revival. Lord, lord send us a revival, send us a revival. Lord, lord send us a revival, us a revival. and let it Begin in me. God bless you. Go in peace and serve the Lord. See you on tomorrow night. Amen and amen.